Gopi Jana Bala Bhagiri Bharadari Gopi Jana Bala Bhagiri Bharadari Yashoda Nandana Praja Jana Ranjama Yashoda Nandana Praja Jana Ranjama Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Nittai Gaur Hari Bho, Hari Bho, Hari Bho, Nittai Gaur Hari Bho. Jai Jai Prabhupad, Prabhupad. Prabhu Pajai Shula Prabhu Pajai. Gaur Premanande Haribo. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So 
I'm going to read a verse from Bhagavad Gita. This is chapter 13, Nature, Enjoyer, and Consciousness, text number five. Rishibir Bahuda Gitam Chando Bir Vividai Pritak Brahma Sutra Padas Chaiva Hetu Mad Bir Venas Chitai Rishibir Bahuda Gitam Chando Bir Vividai Pritak Brahma Sutra Padais Chaiva Hetu Mad Bir Venas Chitai Rishi Bir Bahuda Gitam Chando Bir Vividai Pritak Brahma Sutra Padais Chaiva by the wise sages, Bahuda in many ways, Gitam described, Chandobi by Vedic hymns, Vividai various. Pritak variously, Brahma Sutra of the Vedanta, Pedai by the aphorisms, Cha also, Eva certainly, Etu Madhi with cause and effect, Venus Jitai. Certain translation that knowledge of the field of activities and the knower of activities is described by various sages in various Vedic writings. It is especially presented in Vedanta Sutra with all reasoning as to cause and effect. You can all please repeat after me. That knowledge of the field of activities and of the knower of activities is described by various sages in various Vedic writings. It is especially presented in Vedanta Sutra with all reasoning as to cause and effect. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, is the highest authority in explaining the knowledge. Still, as a matter of course, learned scholars and st standard authorities always give evidence from previous authorities. Krishna is explaining the most controversial point regarding the duality and non-duality of the soul and the super soul by referring to a scripture, the Vedanta, which is accepted as authority. First, he says, this is according to different sages. As far as the sages are concerned, besides himself, Vyasadeva, the author of the Vedanta Sutra, is a great sage. And in the Vedanta Sutra, duality is perfectly explained. And Vyasadeva's father, Parasara is also a great sage, and he writes in his books of religiosity, Aham Tvam Cha Tatanyay. We, you, I, 
and the various other living entities are all transcendental, although in material body. Now we are fallen into the ways of the three modes of material nature according to our different karma. As such, some are on higher levels and some are in the lower nature. The higher and lower natures exist due to ignorance and are being manifested in an infinite number of living entities. But the super soul, which is infallible, is uncontaminated by the three qualities of nature and is transcendental. Similarly, in the original Vedas, a distinction between the soul and the super soul and the body is made, especially in the Kata Upanishad. There are many great sages who have explained this, and Parashara is, is considered principal among them. The word Chandobi refers to the various Vedic literatures. The Taitariya Upanishad, for example, which is a branch of the Yajurveda, describes nature, the living entity, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <coughs> As stated before, Kshetra is the field of activities, and there are two kinds of Kshetragna, the individual living entity and the supreme living entity. As stated in the Taitariya Upanishad, Brahma Pucham Pratishta, there is a manifestation of the Supreme Lord's energy known as Anamaya, dependent upon food for existence. This is a materialistic realization of the Supreme. Then in Prana Maya, after realizing the Supreme Absolute Truth in food, one can realize the Absolute Truth in the living symptoms or life forms. In Jnana Maya, realization extends beyond the living entities, beyond the living symptoms to the point of thinking, feeling, and willing. Then there is Brahma realize, Brahman realization called Vigyana Maya, in which the living entity's mind and life symptoms are distinguished from the living entity himself. The next and supreme stage is Ananda Maya, realization of the all blissful nature. Thus, there are five stages of Brahman realization, which are called Brahmapucham. Out of these, the first three, Anamaya, Pranamaya, and Jnanamaya, involve the field of activities of the living entities. Transcendental to all these fields of activities is the Supreme Lord, who is called Anandamaya. The Vedanta Sutra also describes the Supreme by saying, Ananda Maya Bayasat, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is by nature full of joy. To enjoy his transcendental bliss, he expands into Vigyana Maya, Prana Maya, Jnana Maya, and Anamaya. In the field of activities, the living entity is considered to be the enjoyer, and different from him, is the Ananda Maya. That means that if the living entity decides, or if the living entity decides to enjoy in dovetailing himself with the Ananda Maya, then he becomes perfect. 
This is a real picture of the Supreme Lord as the Supreme Knower of the field, the living entity as a subordinate knower, and the nature of the field of activities. One has to search for this truth in the Vedic, in the Vedanta Sutra or Brahma Sutras. It is mentioned here that the codes of the Brahma Sutra are very nicely arranged according to cause and effect. Some of the sutras or aphorisms are na viyad ashrute, natma shrute, and parat to touch shrute. The first aphorism indicates the field of activities. The second indicates the living entity, and the third indicates the Supreme Lord, the summoned bonum among all the manifestations of various entities. Om Ajnana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Milikandjena Tasmai Sri Gaurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pricharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatyate Satarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita nam pavane bio vaishna vibhyo namo nama. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda. Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Ramana, Hare. So in this verse, Lord Krishna is giving a statement to Arjuna to establish the nature, the nature, the, the whether the living entity and the super soul are one or different. Right, whether there is duality or non-duality. Duality I means Madhvacharya, he speaks about duality. Shankaracharya, his is more mono, monotheism. Um, not only monotheism, but uh, you know, Advaita. Shank Madhvacharya, Ramanujacharya, they're more Dvaitis. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is also. Vaishnava, the Vaishnava philosophy established the Lord as the Supreme and the living entity as a subordinate to the Supreme Lord. But Shankarites, Mayavada, Gyanis, they say one. They they very fond of the aphorism, Sarvam Kauf Idam Brahma. Everything is Brahman. And they say, we're all Brahman. And they claim we're all on the same level. And they even argue that when Lord Krishna comes into this world, that he comes from the Brahman, which is contrary to the statements of the scriptures. We know in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna himself says, Brahmano hi pratishtaham amritashyavayashyacha. He said, I am the basis of the Brahman. He doesn't say the Brahman is the basis of me. He said, I am the basis of the Brahman. Everything comes from Lord Krishna. And when we say Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, yes, Lord Krishna is also Brahman and we are also Brahman, but there's a difference. And Arjuna understood that. And we see in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna has described Lord Krishna as Parabram Paramdam Pavitram Paramabhama. Lord Krishna is not just simply Brahman, but he is the Supreme Brahman. So here also, Lord Krishna is establishing this important point 
that it's not that everything is one, but there's also a difference. And Lord Krishna, in order to establish this point, he's quoting authorities, sadhu, shastra, and guru. Lord Krishna himself is the Supreme Lord. And Lord Krishna has al already said, there is no truth superior to me. And he has also said that he knows everything, past, present, and future. But still, Lord Krishna, in order to convince all of us, and particularly in this case, Arjuna, to convince everyone, Lord Krishna is quoting Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru. Sadhu, he mentions the Sadhu, Parashara Muni, the father of Srila Vyasadeva. He is considered, he's considered very prominent among the sages. Just as Srila Vyasadeva is prominent, his father, Parashara Muni, is given more prominence. So Lord Krishna quotes Parashat, the, the, the sages, and then he quotes Vedanta Sutra. Vedanta Sutra, of course, is a compilation of Srila Vyasadeva. And it is Nyaya, right? It's not Shruti, it's not Smriti, it's Nyaya, it's logic. And Srila Vyasadeva has given us the Vedanta Sutra. And of course, so many uh, the followers of Shankaracharya, the, in the line of Shankar, Shankar the Gyanis and the Monas, they will spend all their time speculating to understand the conclusion of the Vedanta Sutra. And they try to understand it by their own efforts. But here, Lord Krishna is quoting Vedanta Sutra and he's establishing the statement of Vedanta Sutra and supporting it with the words of the, the sadhu also, great sages like Parashara Muni and Guru. And who is the Guru? Lord Krishna himself is Guru because Arjuna already surrendered to Krishna and said, Shishasteham Sadimam Twam Prapanam. So Lord Krishna is the ultimate guru and the sadhus are there and the shastra are there. Three evidences. You want to establish a fact, you want to establish some conclusion, it must be in accordance with three authorities, not one. Not two, but three. All three have to be there. If one is missing, if there's some difference, if the Shastra says something different from what the Guru and the Sadhus say, something is wrong. And if the Sadhus and the Shastra say something different from the Guru, something is wrong. You have to have perfect Unis, unity, they all have to agree. All three authorities have to confirm that this is the fact. Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru. And Lord Krishna is showing us here in this verse in the Bhagavad Gita, the importance of these three uh, evidences to establish the fact. So Lord Krishna is speaking about the field of activities and the knower of the field. The body is like a field, shitra, right? The field, shitra. In the field, we will plant. Sometimes you plant rice, the rainy season this time, good time to plant rice. Other times we will plant wheat. If you go and maybe in Vrindavan, UP area, it's dry there. So in the dry season, they're going to grow wheat. In different seasons, they will plant. the field is the place for planting. In the same way, our body is like a field. We use our body to plant the seeds of our different activities. Sometimes we do good, good deeds, and sometimes we do bad deeds. We get the results. We harvest the results. Right? You say in India, there's a common saying, Jaisa karega, aisa barega, right? You know, this fact is stated all over the world. Myself, I travel and preach usually in the Far East in countries like China. 
And in China, they have a similar saying. They will say, shan yo shan bao, e yo e bao. The meaning is just like what we say in Hindi, you do good, you'll get good results. You do bad, you'll get bad results. They have another saying, Zhong do de do, zhong gua de gua. If you plant melons, you will harvest melons. And if you plant beans, you will harvest beans. It's a fact, right? You do good, you get good results. You do bad, you get bad. This is logic. So the, the body is like a field and we are harvesting the results. Within this body, there's the Shetrakna, the knower of the field. And the knower of the field in this body, we say it's not one, but it's two. Of course, this is controversial point, right? But Lord Krishna is dealing with this point in the Bhagavad Gita. That we know there are two main philosophies in India. There is Dvaita and Advaita. Some one time uh, there was one journal, one magazine from Delhi. They came to meet Prabhupada and they asked him, who's right? Is it Dvaita or Advaita? Prabhupada said they're both right. Let them both chant Hare Krishna. That's the solution to the problem. Don't argue about all these things. Just chant Hare Krishna. Of course, we see sometimes the Advaitis, they're also chanting Hare Krishna, but their chanting of Hare Krishna is not like the devotees chanting Hare Krishna. But they're thinking chanting Hare Krishna to become one with Krishna, to become one, to, to achieve their Sayuja Mukti. That's their goal for them. For the in-person, for the monas, their goal is Sayuja Mukti, merging into the oneness of the Brahman. Because they say, ultimately, everything is one. But we say, no, it's not one, it's two. <laughs> right? The Vaishnava Acharyas came after Shankaracharya. You can see the progression. You know, Lord Buddha came. And Lord Buddha came to lead the people away from the Vedas. And Lord Buddha taught that the absolute truth is zero. The Buddhists are all shunyavadis, that everything is zero. They say nothing is real. The world is not real. We are not real. And the whole philosophy of Buddhism is negation. Stop everything. And that is why Buddhism failed in India. Although Buddhism at one point was spread all over India, it was so rampant in India that even Mathura was the headquarters, was the main Buddhist center in India. And you go to the Mathura Museum today, you'll see all the Buddha relics there in the museum from the past. So Buddhism came, it rose in India, but it's not here today, of course by different, one reason why it's no Buddhism, Shankaracharya preached. And Shankaracharya, you see, the Buddhists were saying absolute truth is nothing, zero. Shankaracharya said not zero, it's one. A little difference, just a little change. But that defeated the, the Buddhists. The, the Buddhists all got, they, had, they, they left. But another reason why the Buddhist philosophy failed was because nothing was being done. Everybody was just, you know, they were all engaged in their meditation. They were sitting doing nothing. No work was being done. No crops were growing. Nobody was plowing the field. Nobody was taking care of the cows. Everything just stopped because everybody just saying samadhi. So that was one reason, another reason why they got rid of Buddhism, because it didn't help for the development of the country at all. And there was no food being grown. People were going hungry. They're saying, anyway, you, you're not, you don't really exist. You're not really a person. <laughs> so star. It's a, such a foolish philosophy. 
Prabhupada said, if I take my if I take my shoes and beat you over the head with it, it's not real. Don't worry about it. So, so the, the Buddhists, anyway, they have this idea. But they became very, the philosophy became rampant. Then Shankaracharya came and he brought, the not zero is one. And he brought back the Vedas. By doing that, he, started, he brought back the Vedas. Because he said the absolute truth is Brahman. And Sarvam Kauvidam Brahman. And they brought back the Vedas and the Vedic culture and the Brahmins. Before, the Buddhists had kicked out the Brahmanas. No need of Brahm Brahmanas had become corrupt and degraded, killing all the animals, all the, all the killing of animals in the name of Yagya was all uh, stopped by the Buddhists. But they led, he led the people away from the Vedas and stopped uh, taking care, stopped killing all the animals. But then Shankaracharya brought back the Vedas, but gave the monistic understanding, this idea, everything is one. But then the Vaishnava Acharyas came and you have Ramanujacharya and then Madhvacharya and then others like Nimbarka, Vishnu Swami, they all came. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to bring these four Sampradayas together to take the essence from each of the four Sampradayas into one. And that is what you have in the Godiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. He took the main elements from each of the four Sampradayas and brought them together to give these teachings. And that's what we, the, the Krishna consciousness movement is teaching. We're followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who established the Brahma, Madhva, Godiya Vaishnav Sampradaya. So Godiya Vaishnavas. So Lord Krishna is presenting this point here the, about the duality. Is it, is it one or two? No, Lord Krishna is explaining that from Prabhupada's purport also, we get evidence. There's not one, it's two. And Prabhupada also goes into this Brahma Pujam. Five different realizations of Brahman. Anamaya. Anamaya, everything is just food. Just like little baby, when the baby is born, all they know is food. You know, all they can do is drink the milk of their mother. They can't do anything. They can't talk, hardly can open their eyes. Their only consciousness is food. That is Anamaya grain, you know, we want food, we want to eat. So some people have that kind of consciousness, some animals, newborn children. Jai Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Ki Jai. So they have that kind of mentality, they want, just want food. And then a little higher than Anamaya is Pranamaya, life symptoms. And they have life symptoms, they have some feelings they can the the child grows a little bit they can move and talk and you know when they get hungry they'll cry they'll tell you like so like that becoming more conscious so that's run and then you have after that we have manamaya thinking feeling willing and then you vigyanamaya Vigyanamaya, understanding more that we're, we're not the body, understanding myself as a spirit being, spiritual being, Vigyanamaya. People often can understand we're not the body, but it's more difficult for them to understand that we're the servant of the super soul, to understand the relationship between the living entity and the super soul is more difficult, it's more of a challenge for them. Many people can understand, not the body, they know that, but they don't always understand that there's not just one soul, but there are two souls. Two souls in the one body, in the one heart, two souls. So that is for higher consciousness. Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, 
of those who are endeavoring for perfection, hardly one knows me in truth. And so you don't find many devotees, so many devotees. You find a lot of people who may be into self-realization. They understand their Brahman, but they don't understand much more than Brahman. Brahman, understanding Brahman, that's the first step. They have to go on from that. Come to the platform of Brahman, then they should engage in devotional service. Without taking up devotional service, just to come to the platform of Brahman, their position will not be secure. And at any time they can fall back again under the modes of nature the three modes of nature. So Brahma Pucham, five different, the, the, the topmost being Ananda Moya. So the Supreme Lord, he is Ananda Moya. Uh, we are also pleasure seeking, the living entities named Ananda Moya by Asad. We also want to enjoy, we're looking for pleasure. So the actual pleasure for the living entity comes when we engage in transcendental loving service, in the service of the Supreme Lord, or in the service of the super soul. This is the transcendental consciousness, when we can actually be steadily fixed on the transcendental platform. Brahma Buddha Prasanatma Nashochati Nakanchati Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Right? So first become come to the platform of Brahman, Brahma Bhuta. Be a happy, joyful soul, knowing we're not the body. But it doesn't stop there. That's just the beginning. Nasochati, Nakanchati, don't hanker and lament for anything. We're not thinking about the past. You know, we lament about the past and we hanker for the future. So not that's, that's not for devotional service. Don't be hankering and lamenting. And samasarveshu bhuteshu, see all living entities equally. I was with Srila Prabhupada one time in England. We went to a Hindu temple and they were worshipping Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. So Srila Prabhupada said to them, a devotee of Krishna not only offers his respects to Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, they will offer their respect even to a tiny insect, because they know the Lord is also in the heart of the tiny insect. So this kind of vision, Samasarvishu Bhuteshu, seeing all living entities equally, then then we can actually take up devotional service. We want to understand how to take up devotional service. Actually, this is devotional service. It begins by hearing. We have to hear from Krishna. Krishna, Lord Krishna spoke this Bhagavad Gita, to Arjuna, and by speaking to Arjuna, he is instructing all of us. Lord Krishna came to establish religious principles, and he did it speaking Bhagavad Gita. So this Bhagavad Gita, this is perennial knowledge. It is eternal knowledge. Right now, Lord Krishna is speaking Bhagavad Gita in some other universe. It's going on continually. Lord Krishna travels to, uh, throughout the creation, speaking Bhagavad Gita for the enlightenment of all of us fallen conditioned souls. We are in the minority. The vast majority of living entities are liberated souls. They're in the spiritual world. Lord Krishna comes here just simply to try to attract us and to bring us out of our illusion of thinking that we are the controller or we are the enjoyer. Lord Krishna personally comes himself sometimes 
And sometimes he will send his pure devotees. He will send from the spiritual world just different devotees. Uh, just like Srila Prabhupada glorified his own spiritual master, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, that he's described as a ray of Vishnu. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was described as a ray of Vishnu. He, of course, he, he appeared in the family, the son, seminal son of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur who was also a very, very great devotee and who did so much work to spread and awaken Krishna consciousness and who actually envisioned that in the future, Krishna consciousness would be propagated all over the world. So Srila Prabhupada came also, and he was also born in the Vaishnava family and he's preaching Krishna consciousness. And he knew his spiritual master desired that Krishna consciousness would be spread all over the world. So Srila Prabhupada, in the very beginning of our movement, even when he just had a few devotees, he began to send people to different places. He sent people, one, one young, one devotee got sent to Australia Another devotee got other devotees. There were three householder couples. They got sent to England. Another young man was sent to Germany. He'd been in Germany preaching there. And uh, Prabhupada even sent one man to Pakistan to preach there. And the devotee even went there. In, and it was a time when India was at war with Pakistan. <laughs> Or just after that, there was conflict, there was a war. He was stuck there in Pakistan. Prabhupada was worried about his life. He just managed to get out of Pakistan just, just before the situation got too bad. But like that, Prabhupada was always thinking to spread Krishna consciousness because the statement is there in Srimad Bhagavatam, Sukadeva Goswami has described Kirita Hunandra Pulinda Kupokasha Abira Shumba Yavana Kasha Daya Yanye Chapapa Yadapashraya Shraya Shudyanti Tasmai Prabha Vishnave Namaha. It's a very important verse in Srimad Bhagavatam. It comes in the second canto, the prayers of Sukadeva Goswami. Sukadeva Goswami had been asked to describe. And creation and he glorifies like this the power of the devotee that all these different races he mentions different races kirita means the africans now africans sometimes they're considered to be barbaric and uncivilized you know not cultured they don't have a great culture mostly kind of a tribal civilization, not that you, we don't find a lot of uh, sophisticated technology coming from Africa. You know, it's more very basic, but they can also be delivered. And we have wonderful devotees from Africa, very, very nice devotees. And there's a lot of preaching going on in Africa today. Uh, because Prabhupada also went there. And Prabhupada went there, he went to Kenya, and he told that when he went there, he saw the devotee who's, who'd been there, he was mainly preaching to the, the, the Indian people. <laughs> you know? He didn't preach much to the African people. So Prabhupada told him, he said, I did not send you here to Africa just to preach to the Indian people. You have to preach to the local people. It's very important that the local people should join. And even it happened that uh, Prabhupada went to Geneva. You know, Switzer in Switzerland, Geneva? There's one city, Geneva, where the United Nations have headquarters there. So 
to Geneva. So we had a temple there for some time, and Prabhupada went there and spent eight days there, actually. A devotee arranged programs every day for Srila Prabhupada. Every day they took him on programs to meet different people, and different people came to see him. So many devotees had come there to Geneva to be with Prabhupada. They'd come from France and they'd come from Germany and different parts of Europe. They'd all come there because they'd heard Prabhupada was going to be there and they wanted to be with Prabhupada and to get his association. So they, they, they took a group photograph, Prabhupada with all the devotees. So Prabhupada then said to the person in charge, he said, how many of these devotees come from Geneva? <laughs> and the devotee said, Prabhupada, none of them. <laughs> there are no devotees from Geneva, Prabhupada. All the devotees had come from other places. Prabhupada said, that is not good. You have to get the local people. Very important. The local people have to... If you don't have the local people, then your movement is a failure. Very important. Prabhupada made this point to the devotees there. And so, you know, the same was true in Africa. You preach in Africa, you have to preach to the African people. And I quoted that verse by Shukadeva Goswami. He talks about many different races. And the last race he talks about is Kashadaya. Kash. Kasha Desh and Adaya, others. Kasha means what is today China. You see? So Prabhupada also wanted devotees to go to China, that they should preach there. And the devotees had gone, one devotee had he'd been in Japan and he went to Hong Kong. He went from Hong Kong to Japan, went by boat, he took the boat there and went to Hong Kong and started to preach there in Hong Kong. And they made one Chinese man a devotee and he translated the Bhagavad Gita to Chinese. So Prabhupada was very enthusiastic, very happy that we had printed the Bhagavad Gita in Chinese. And then he, he told devotees that you should go there and distribute these books. Now, Who's going to buy a Chinese Bhagavad Gita? They have to be Chinese, right? You're not going to sell a Chinese Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> so devotees, uh, you know, the, for some time, they're, they're trying to distribute these books. Anyway, Prabhupada was, he, he, he wanted that devotees should go everywhere to preach Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada instilled in us the consciousness that devotees of Krishna are everywhere they're in every krishna's in everyone's heart so the devotees of krishna are everywhere but they're waiting for the devotee to come and find them you have to go there and find them Prabhupada said you go there you take carta house and bring them a danga you play the madanga someday will come along they can play the carta you can have kirtan <laughs> and Prabhupada did like that he went to america and he was going in the park on his own chanting, people would come. So Prabhupada wanted that we would preach in China. So it happened that one time there was some problem among the devotees in America. Uh, the, there was, a, there, was a, 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 there were many devotees. It was a very dynamic period of our Krishna consciousness movement. And there was a lot of book distribution going on all over America. And you'd see devotees everywhere. I remember I went to America uh, in the 1970s and people said, we see, I see you everywhere, you people. <laughs> yeah. The people were just seeing devotees everywhere, every street corner, every airport, bus station, you know. They said, wherever I go, I can see, I can see you people, you're always there. They're, you know, they said, how many people have you got? How many members have you got? We weren't very many, but they thought we were a huge number of people because they were always seeing devotees. So we were very active, you know, we were young people 
you know, I could imagine, you know, 50 years ago, I, I was much younger, <laughs> you know. And so uh, we were very active and energetic, and we spent a lot of time out on the streets, meeting the public and distributing books and preaching to people like that. So, uh, but what happened was there was a, another thing happened that some sannyasis came and they got the idea that they would travel in buses. And we see also here in India, also some of our devotees have a bus, like uh, Mumbai Juhu Temple, they have buses. And also uh, Mayapur Temple, they also have buses. And they send their men out all over different parts of India, right? They go around different parts of the country distributing books. So that was going on in America. And we had the buses and the devotees were traveling in the buses and preaching and distributing books. But at the same time, we had temples. So somehow there was a conflict between the people with the buses and the people with the temples. Because the tendency was that uh, the sannyasis and the brahmacharis, that they should be with the buses and the grihastas, they should be in the temples. So the, the problem was that not everybody wanted to be in the temple and not everybody wanted to be in the bus. But there was some coming and going, you know, some people would leave the temple and join the bus. Some people from the bus would go to the temple. But if somebody was really good at book distribution, if they could distribute a lot of books, then you wanted to keep that man with you. You didn't want to lose him. If somebody was a big book distributor, he's a big preacher, he's very valuable because we would have competition. Who could distribute the most books? And it was, you know, it's very prestigious that Oh, that temple, they distributed the most number of books. Oh, they're a very great temple. You know, they distributed so many books. They got a lot of praise, you see. So if somebody was a big book distributor, they wanted them. There was one devotee. There was one devotee. Prabhupada called him an incarnation of book distribution. Yeah. Triparari. Name was Tripurari Prabhu. He's a sannyasi now. He's separated himself from his gone, but he's still preaching. He's a, he has his own temples and his own disciples. But in Prabhupada's time, he was very, very active and he trained a lot of devotees how to distribute books. So, like that, there, were, there was a problem, though, there was this conflict. And the, the person who was in charge of the buses was a, a devotee called Tamal Krishna Goswami. So Tamala Krishna Goswami, he got a little bit chastised by Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, you know, because Prabhupada wanted the temples. He thought the temples are more important than the buses. The buses, you know, they're, you know, okay, but the temples have to be maintained. And you can't stop the temples because the deities and everything are there with the temple. So Prabhupada told, told him, I'm taking everything away from you. I'm taking all the buses away from you. And, and Tamal Krishna was, felt very, oh, Prabhupada, I might as well go to China if you're going to do that. And Prabhupada said, yes, you go to China. <laughs> And he said, no, no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> when Prabhupada said, yes, you go to China, he said, no, 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 Prabhupada, I didn't mean that. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, no, you said it. Krishna made you say it. Now you have to go. So that was, he got the order that he was supposed to go to China. Mm, reluctantly, he was reluctant. You know, he was an American, you know, and <laughs> it wasn't easy for him to go to China. But anyway, Prabhupada gave him that order. And so he, after Prabhupada disappeared from the world, actually Tamal Krishna Goswami was a very intimate disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And he personally served Srila Prabhupada. He was Prabhupada's secretary. And then he personally served Prabhupada for the last one year 
of his manifested pastime in this world and who was with Prabhupada right till Prabhupada left, departed from the body. So after he departed from the body, then Tamal Krishna Maharaj thought about his instructions because you get instruction from the guru. The instruction is eternal. The guru, there's two ways to associate. There is Vani and Vapu. Some people associate with the Vani and some people associate with the Vapu. Now the Vapu, the physical body is not eternal. And after the person leaves the body, then you only have the Vani. So the Vani is more important. The instruction is more important. So after Prabhupada left, then all of the devotees, we're all, you know, I'm also Prabhupada disciple. We're all thinking about what does Prabhupada want me to do? What was Prabhupada's instruction and everything? So Tamal Krishna Goswami had that instruction from Prabhupada that he should go to China. So he thought how to go to China because in 1970s, China was closed. You couldn't get to China. It was really closed up. So he went to Hong Kong because in that time, Hong Kong was a British colony. It's not now, but it was up until 1996. Then it went back to China. So Tom Jai Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Ki Jai. So Tamal Krishna Goswami moved to Hong Kong, made his base there in Hong Kong. At the same time, it sometimes go back to America. He had a base also in America, but he made Hong Kong his office for the China mission. And he was based there in Hong Kong and he was overseeing the translation of the books to Chinese because Prabhupada told us, he said, even you cannot go to China, you can send the books there and the books will, they'll, they'll make the, the field for preaching. And the devotees had done that with Russia. You know, in the past, in Prabhupada's time, Russia was also communist and closed up. So how did they manage to get uh, Krishna consciousness into Russia? The devotees were sending books constantly. Any way they could, they would find a way to send books into Russia. And they, they would do some amazing things. Even Germany was divided, East and West Germany. And there was a big border, a partition between East and West Germany. And so it was... Very difficult, you know, but somehow the devotees were finding ways to get books into Germany, into the other, other side of Germany, and then into Russia. And they were distributing many, many books because Russian people were very eager for Krishna consciousness. And in fact, it was so bad that the, the KGB, the top, you know, secret agency in Russia, which catches all the spies and all the traitors and everything. The KGB declared three main enemies in Russia. One was the Beatles music. One was Coca-Cola and the other was Hare Krishna. They didn't want any kind of American culture there in Russia in those days. And they declared Hare Krishna was a big threat to the, so, the stability of the Soviet Union. Of course, Soviet Union is all broken now. It's all finished, you know. They don't have that anymore. But in 1970s, it was like that. And devotees were sending books. And, and then, of course, then you had the, the communist system all broke down. And they, it broke apart and Russia became open. And when it opened up, that was when they, they said, you know, they said, you better get ready for China because, you, you know, they'd been working Russia for a long time and cultivating people and sending books there and going there and preaching there. They had many, many devotees in different places all over Russia. But well, they said, you better get ready. China could open up too. Actually, China is quite different from Russia. And I don't think it will open up like Russia. It's much more stable. And they have a 
a different culture, a different history than Russia. But, you know, they, they're also communist, socialist. So they told Tamal Krishna Goswami, you know, you were given the order by Prabhupada, you have to go to China. You should do something. You should. So we start, uh, so he started to send books there. In those days, people were all mostly working in Hong Kong and every Chinese New Year, they would go back to China. People would come from China to work in Hong Kong. But uh, Chinese New Year, they want to go home and they'll go back. So we would go to the train station and we'd give everybody books. Take the book, take the book, take it to send books into China, you see. Because Prabhupada said, send the books there and the books will create the field there. The books will create. And it happened. It really happened like that. We took what one man, actually, he got a book coming back. And he, this man, actually, he was a Buddhist. He'd been a Buddhist, brought up in a Buddhist family. And he read the book coming back. You know that book coming back? The Science of Reincarnation. So he read that book. He said, oh, he said, I want to help you spread this knowledge all over China. He just read that one book. He, he said, I want to help you spread this knowledge all over China. He was so impressed. He thought, this is wonderful. And so he did. He helped us. He's still a friend of ours. He's very elderly now. He's, just, he's a Buddhist monk now, but he's still very favorable to Krishna consciousness. And whenever we have programs, he will come. He's a very nice man. And he has many followers also. But he's a Buddhist, you know, but we don't mind. We don't mind. Buddhist, Christian, whatever. The main thing is chant Hare Krishna and be happy, right? Eat Krishna Prasadam, chant Hare Krishna. We don't mind. You can keep, we're not trying to convert people. Prabhupada doesn't, didn't try to convert anybody. Just give them this knowledge, Krishna consciousness, understand this knowledge. So we put a lot of emphasis distributing books. And sometimes people would get the books. One man got the book and he took us to his home and he, he copied sections of the book. He'd written it up on the wall, big slokas from the Bhagavad Gita. He put it on the wall, wrote, written up in big letters and hang it up on the wall, stuck it on his wall. He was so impressed with this knowledge. He said, wonderful. He said, I never heard that, never read anything like this before. So that, that is uh, how people responded to Krishna consciousness in these countries, you see. Like in Russia, people were so desperate to get our books. They just, they just were so eager because they had been denied all of these things for so long. But actually the nature of the soul, we want to hear. We want to know all of these things. Okay, are there any questions? Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, thank you very much, Maharaj, for sharing the preaching experiences in US and China. I read in your introduction that you are also preaching in China. Yeah. Can you share some of your experiences? Well, I told you some of the things, right? Take the books, go there with the books, give out the books and find out who's interested, right? Did you read the book? <laughs> First of all, you want to know, did you read the book? You know, if they read the book, then must be a little interested. Some, some people read it, they put, oh, no, I'm not interested. They'll find out immediately, are they interested? But I heard that it is, uh, they're not allowed to preach openly. And uh, Yeah, of course. Yeah, not allowed. It's a communist country. It, the social, they have the, everybody is indoctrinated into Marxist philosophy. And Karl Marx taught op religion is the opium of the people. So people in general don't have a good opinion about religion. But even, you see, that's the difference between Russia and China. In Russia, people all believe in God. 
Russian people all believe in God. China people don't believe in God. It's very difficult to get them to understand that there's God because they don't have that in their culture for 5,000 years. They, didn't have, they don't have that in their culture. And Russia is different. They all believe in God. You know, they have the, the Russian Orthodox Church. Nowadays in China, the China government have recognized five religions. There is uh, Buddhism, there is Taoism, there is Islam, there is the Catholic Church, which is not under the Pope. It has to be under the China government. And there's also Jesus, the Christians who follow Jesus. You know, Christianity. So these five religions are recognized as official. Why is there no Hinduism there? They say, we don't have any Hindus in China. <laughs> there are no Chinese Hindus. <laughs> so there's no need to have Hindus. <laughs> we just have five religions. And, but if you want to practice these religions, they have to register with the government. And if you register with the government, then that's not very good. You know, if, that, oh, this person, he's got a religion. They look down on you, you know, and you may be, you may be discriminated against for being religious. So there are problems. So you have to do everything in a discreet manner. But just like Prabhupada went to Russia, Russia was also not open to religion. Prabhupada went there, he went, he met the, he met the professor, he met some professor of Asian studies, Professor Kotovsky. But then somehow when Shamsun, Prabhupada's secretary, he happened to meet a run, young Russian man. Young Russian man saw him there, understood he was from the West and he asked him, do you have any Beatles music? And so he said, well, I've got the Beatles guru with me. Come and meet the Beatles guru. So the boy came and the two young men came and they met Prabhupada and they were very open to Krishna consciousness. And the Russian boy had a lot of questions and, you know, and he became the first Russian devotee. And he practically, he spread Krishna consciousness all over Russia. But he got persecuted for it also. Many, many, several Russian devotees were persecuted. They were put in mental hospitals, they were given drugs and things to destroy their brain. These kind of things happened. So it, it's a risk. Now, of course, Russia is a bit better. But that was in 1970s when it was still closed up. Yes, Mariji had a question. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for the enlightening class, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, you, uh, you spoke that it's not right as devotees that we should lament. Uh, we, Krishna puts us in some situations. We know it's the arrangement of the Lord based on our karmas. But um, at a certain point of time, we again tend to, do, knowing the fact, we tend to lament over the situation. So how to overcome this uh, mentality of lamenting? How to overcome lamentation? Well, we have to have knowledge, see everything through the eyes of the scripture. With the help of spiritual knowledge, then you can overcome that lamentation. If we see things in, on the, based on the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, just like when somebody departs from the world, we have to read things like the Bhagavad Gita. And we read about the soul leaving the body and taking another body. We understand about what's happening. So we have to see these different things problems which are coming in our life, we have to see them guided by Shastra. 
whatever happens, something goes wrong in our life, big problem in our life, when we're wondering why this happens to me, we should think that actually it could be much worse. Whatever happened to me could be much worse than it actually is. And a devotee will think, actually, I'm meant to suffer much more, but I'm only suffering a little bit by the grace of Krishna. And in this way, be thankful to Krishna. So we have to control our mind and learn to see things guided by scripture. That's very important for us. We train, we have to train ourselves to conquer the mind. The mind will lament, but we're not the mind. So we have to control the mind by spiritual knowledge. So you have to apply that spiritual knowledge. Someone dies, what is happening? They're changing their body. They're not really dying. The soul never dies, but we change the body. We give up one body, we take another body. Of course, we lament. We feel some, because of our attachment, we, we feel, we lament, but we have to constantly check our mind and try to see everything in the philosophical manner. And that will help us to overcome this lamentation. Often though we lament because we didn't get all the sense gratification we want. Our plans for sense gratification were not fulfilled. So we have to understand it was Krishna's desire. Krishna didn't want us to get that sense gratification. Right? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. answer that one yes of course somebody has bad habits and they want to get over their bad habits they should take shelter of the holy it's also very important if you can connect them to a powerful devotee who can guide them and who can inspire them and lead them, that can be helpful. It might be difficult for them to get attached to the holy name, but it's possible if they do chant, if there's genuine, if they genuinely desire to get free from their bad habits, then let them take shelter of the holy name. Let them chant incessantly and encourage them to do service also. Lord Chaitanya was approached. You know, every year the devotees would come from Mayapur and go to Jagannath Puri for Rathyatra. So there was one devotee, he came to meet Lord Chaitanya. And he said to Lord Chaitanya, he said, you know, I'm very fallen. I'm in householder life and I'm very fallen. 
how can I make advancement? So Lord Chaitanya told him, you should chant the holy name incessantly and you should serve the Vaishnavas, serve the devotees. So two things, incessant chanting and service to the Vaishnavas. So not just only chanting. Of course, if they can just chant and do nothing else, then it's okay. <laughs> but generally people not much able to do so much chanting. You know, we're not able to imitate Haridas. Haridas Thakur, he could chant 22, 22 hours a day. You know, we can hardly chant two hours a day. But service, if, they, if you can engage them in service, get them to do some service for the devotees and for Krishna, that's very powerful. We say Mahat Sevam Dwara Mahur Vimuktes. By serving the devotees, it opens the doors to liberation. So you get the devotee, you can if you can engage him in some service for the devotees. We know Ajam uh, Jagai and Madhai, they were very sinful, they were delivered. There are many examples of fallen souls. It said every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. So you can tell him like that. Okay, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, there is a question online. Uh, are there ISKCON temples in China? No. Uh, there are no temples in China. We're not legal. We have a temple in Hong Kong, though. Hong Kong is officially a part of China, but there's, it's one country, two systems. The system in Hong Kong is different from China. So we do have a temple in Hong Kong. Uh, another devotee is asking, Maharaj. I want to know about knower of the field. I want to know about knower of the field. The knower of the field, the knower of the field, there's the, the soul and the super soul. There are two knowers of the field. Shetragna, two knowers of the field. The body is the field and the knower of the field is the soul and the super soul. Two knowers. Now, the soul only knows one field, but the super soul knows all fields. Because the super soul is in each and everyone's heart. The super soul is expanded in every living entity. Just like a king or a, 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 a landlord, he may own many buildings, many houses, right? So he knows about all the houses, but he's the landlord, it's all his property. But you only know your own building. You only know your own house. You don't know all the houses. The landlord, he knows. The same way that the king, he knows all the land. He knows all the fields. But the farmer, he only knows his own field. So we know our own body. We know our pains and problems with our body. We don't know about other people's pains and problems with their bodies. But we know about our own body. But the super soul knows about each and every body, each and every living entity. That is the position of the super soul. The two knowers of the field. Like two birds in the tree. One bird is eating the fruit and the other bird is the witness. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes how the super soul is upadrasta and anumanta, upadra, overseer and permitter. The super soul is watching, just like two birds in the tree. One bird is eating the fruit, and the other bird is the what the witness watching. See, he remembers everything. We don't remember. 
Sometimes the fruit is good, sometimes the fruit is bitter, sometimes it's sweet, sometimes it's bad. Different tastes we're experiencing. Super soul is a witness. So, Sarvasya Chaham Ridisani Visto Matak Smitir Gyanam Apohan. Super soul gives knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. We forget. Super soul reminds us remembers everything. The two knowers in the field. We want to take shelter of the super soul. Okay. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Hare Krishna. Tomorrow morning also we'll be having Srimad Bhagavatam at 8 o'clock by Maharaj, tomorrow, day, day after tomorrow, and again on Sunday also. So, we request devotees to take advantage of the association of Maharaj. Let us express our gratitude by chanting Hare Krishna Mantra once. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare 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 uh, in RR Nagar at uh, Gornitai Complex, Prasadeshwar Prabhu's uh, building. So, devotees who are free can join there also. And the Prasadam will be served for all the devotees now. Hare Krishna.